Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl. Writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things, but on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked on Kentucky, we are going to be previewing Kentucky basketball's matchup with the Providence Friars in the NCAA tournament tomorrow. Going to be going over the individual matchups, going to talk about the strengths, the weaknesses of the Friars, and to give my score prediction as well. Well, thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody that we are free and available on all platforms. If you can't tell, very similar to last year, uh, I am a little bit under the weather. Uh, I have uh, been somebody that has not really struggled with allergies for the majority of my life, but the past two seasons, uh, I, I don't know what it is, but right here, right as the NCAA tournament begins, uh, my throat has just absolutely been shot, and my allergies just have run wild. So at any point in this episode, if I pause for multiple times for water, or if I just uh, break down crying, then you understand why. That second part is a joke. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. The Providence Friars taking all the Kentucky Wildcats in the first round of the NCAA tournament tomorrow. Uh, that game's on Friday. Today, obviously, a lot of different other games going on for the first round. I'm actually going to be going to some of them uh, in Birmingham, Alabama here uh, in just a little while. Providence is, according to Ken Palm, the 45th best team in the country. Did not look to see where they are overall in the tournament in terms of ranking. They are 56th in the net, 21-11 and 11 overall. I think the first thing we need to know about this team is, Talking about, you know, kind of what the confidence level looks like for some of these schools heading into March Madness, uh, Providence is not a team that has a lot of momentum heading into this postseason tournament. Right now, the Friars, I think, have a lot of different areas where they do uh, excel, which we'll get to in a second. But overall, I mean, they've not really been winning as of late. They've lost three out of their last four. They lost actually four out of their last five to enter the tournament, and uh Two of those were just absolute blowouts to UConn and Xavier. Uh, now they go up against a Kentucky squad that, uh, according to Haslam metrics, is playing pretty good basketball right now. And I think that is definitely something you have to factor in when you're talking about these matchups here is, okay, what does the mental confidence look like for these individual teams, right? I think that's certainly an aspect of whether or not you go out there and you put your best foot forward, you put your best performance out there, which Providence's best performance seems like a pretty efficient offensive outing with a good defensive outing paired with it. Right now, the Friars are 4-8 uh, against quad one opponents, 3-2 and two against quad two, 3-1 and one against quad three, and 11-0 or 11 and 0 against quad four. The 11-0 mark, 11 and 0 mark is something I want to point out here for a second. Fry, the Friars have not played a lot of strong teams. Their strength of schedule is good, but their non-conference schedule was abysmal, and it allowed them to rack up a lot of different, I don't want to say cheap wins, but easier wins against no-name non-conference schools. Teams like Merrimack, teams like Stonehill, who, if I'm not mistaken, is literally new to Division I college basketball, Northeastern, Ryder, Albany, Manhattan, the list just goes on and on and on. This team, while solid, and I want to pr make the point here, they are a good team. Up until their Big East slate, they hadn't have faced anybody. They hadn't faced anybody. They started off six and one in league play. They beat Marquette in overtime. They beat UConn uh, at home by a decent margin as well. Then they lost to Creighton. Then they lost to Marquette. Lost to Xavier. Lost to St. John's in the middle of February, which was kind of a weird loss for them. They've beaten the teams that they should, and they've lost to the teams that they should. They've had a couple of victories in here to help boost their resume overall, but this Providence team hasn't gone out of their way to pull a serious upset. I would say until, all, I would go all the way back to that Connecticut game on January, in January. Now, Creighton is a very good team, who they beat in double overtime back on February 14th. I wouldn't necessarily say that that's like a major upset uh, for the Friars. So what do we know about them from an offensive and defensive standpoint? Well, 
According to uh, Kim Palm, their adjusted offensive efficiency is 16th nationally, top 20 nationally. They run a tight ship there. The problem for the Friars is that it does not necessarily come from the field. Their percentage of points, actually, their, their, their highest percentage of points in terms of ranking nationally is from free throws. They get 21% of their points from the foul line. That's 41st na- nationally. They draw fouls, and they get there, and they score. They knock down the free throws at a high rate. They're shooting about 74% from the foul line, which is good. They rebound the ball well. They're an offensive rebounding team, which is interesting whenever, it mat- when, whenever you talk about the way it matches up with the Wildcats. They shoot the three well. They get to the rim consistently. They don't take a lot of threes at all. And they do a decent job of scoring at the rim. Now, the problem with this team on the offensive end, outside of the fact that they just do not take threes, is the fact that they're short. This team, according to Kim Palm, has an average height that is 277th nationally. We're going to get to the individual players here, but they do not have a team, or excuse me, a player in their rotation that they consistently use outside of Clifton Moore who barely gets in there, they don't have a player that is high, that is taller than six foot eight. Clifton Moore is six eleven, but he he's played in all thirty two games, only started one, does not get a lot of run. Period. Full stop. That is an advantage that Kentucky has to take uh, take advantage of. Well, way to way to phrase that one, Lance. The height is not in their is not uh, in their favor in this one. But it's a, it is a good offense. They're averaging 78 points per game. That's top 40 in the country. They have the ability to turn it on. They have the ability to score. They scored 103 against Marquette back in December. They scored, what was it, 94 in double overtime against Creighton. They scored 88 in a win over Georgetown. Scored 89 in a loss to Xavier just on March 1st. They can put points on the board. But as of late, as of these last two games, they've really struggled to do that, 58 and 66. Again, the lack of momentum is not startling because it's not my team, um, but it is something that you have to be aware of when you talk about what they can do for an upset bid. It's an efficient offense, though, on the whole this season. Uh, Hunter Shelton over at Sports Illustrated, if I'm not mistaken, he's the one that wrote this article. Uh, He pointed out that while glancing at Kentucky's losses this season, a clear theme of struggling against teams that could fill up the cup is apparent. They've lost to Gonzaga, who is first in offensive uh, efficiency. Missouri, who is 10th. Bama, who is 19th. Vanderbilt twice, who is 22nd. UCLA, Kansas, Michigan State, Arkansas. All those teams are top 50 nationally in offensive efficiency. The only two outliers there are Georgia and South Carolina, who are 187th and 203rd, uh, which is just, you know, sometimes teams shoot the three well, sometimes they just get to the rim well. It it do be like that sometimes, according to Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson. When looking at Kentucky's top wins this season and this is still Hunter Shelton here, you'll see plenty of teams with a great adjusted defensive efficiency. They beat Tennessee twice, who is second nationally in adjusted defensive efficiency, Mississippi State, who is sixth, Arkansas, who is 16th, Auburn, who is 29th, Florida twice, who is 30th, and Texas A&M, who is 37th. So if there's any pattern that Kentucky has, for the most part, followed this season, it's handling better defenses and struggling with better offenses. Advantage, Providence. And that is what Hunter Shelton had to say about this game. I'm going to pause for water here real quick. Sometimes the throat just, sometimes it really just does struggle. So, that's what we know about the Friars' offense. I want to get to the Friars in their in their defense and kind of break down what the Kentucky Wildcats could do on, on an individual basis. Before I get to that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. We are past the midway point of the NBA season and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, and that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. All you have to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drain. You can also bet on player props like points, rebounds, assists, all that good stuff. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So... Don't miss your chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
All right, continuing along here on the Thursday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl, struggle busting it here with you. Really appreciate you guys making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. But if you have not checked out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, um, question to you, what are you doing with your life? Genuine question. Andy Patton and Isaac Shea do an incredible job over there on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Would highly encourage you guys to go search it up on YouTube, look at their bracket predict- predictions, Listen to what they have to say about these individual tournament games. They do a great job breaking things down over there. And if you pull up uh, to their YouTube channel, leave a comment. Tell them I sent you. Tell them I said, hey, locked on, or tell, tell them Locked On Kentucky sent you over and, and tell them how awesome they are. Uh, I think they would really appreciate that. So, again, the Locked On College Basketball Podcast is wherever you get your podcasts. So, the Providence Friars, their starting five is solid. All five of their players average over 10 points per game. Uh, and most of them do it uh, at a pretty efficient clip shooting the basketball. That's going to be a problem in and of itself. But what I don't think is going to be a problem is Kentucky matching up in the half-court offense with Oscar Shibwe. As we have noted, this entire season, when Shibwe goes up against size and length in the paint, he has the tendency to struggle on both ends of the floor. Now, it does not necessarily take a 6'11", 250-pound big man to override him defensively. But offensively, if he can get somebody that's smaller in there, he can work his way into a 25-point outing at 6'9", 260 pounds. Like I mentioned earlier, there is nobody in this rotation for the Friars that is taller than six foot eight. Now we've seen guys like Julius Marble. We've seen guys like Henry Coleman, if I'm not mistaken, the um the forward for Michigan State, who is currently slipping my mind. This is gonna drive me nuts, so I gotta pull it up. It's not Joey Hauser. It's Matty Sissico. Yeah, it's it's Sissico, who who just body bagged Kentucky in the paint last year or earlier this season. Was that last year? I think it was last year. Holy cow. Anyway. The starting five for the Friars doesn't have anybody, I don't think, that can shut Shibway down. I'm going to make that prediction to you. I don't think that Shibway's going to go off. I just don't think that he's going to be held for like two for 13. I think that at the bare minimum, he has an average outing. Who knows? Providence may be focusing in on him. We've seen that not matter at different times over the past two seasons. We've seen Oscar Sheepway just kind of power through people anyway because, as the kids say, he's built different. But I, 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 I'm hesitant to say any sort of definitive about this game because of how wrong a lot of people were about Kentucky in the, in the postseason last year. But I will say, um, I don't think Clifton Moore is going to come off the bench enough to affect Oscar Sheepway. I don't think Ed Croswell, the six foot eight forward, the six foot eight senior is going to do enough to override Sheepway. I don't think he's going to be the better forward in this game. Kentucky has the advantage in the paint. I think you look at Bryce Hopkins, who's really good at getting to the rim. You look at Devin Carter, who is really good at getting to the rim. You look at Noah Locke, who transferred in from Florida, was previously at Louisville, is shooting almost forty percent from three. Ed Croswell is shooting 50, by the way. Hopkins is shooting 37.8% from deep. This kid has found his shot. He has just unlocked it. I don't think they're going to do anything on the defensive end to hold Shibwe and Jacob Toppin down. Let's be clear. Kentucky's got several players that can get to the rim. They are 30th nationally, the Wildcats are, in percentage of points from inside the arc. They get to the rim. That's the offense. We all know that. Kentucky doesn't take threes. When they shoot them, they typically go in at a higher rate than on average. But Kentucky's players, Reeves, Wallace, Toppin, Shibway, Livingston, they get to the rim. They score twos at the rim. Severe Wheeler may be available for this game. If he's available, this does unlock another aspect of this offense. But here's the question. Just because he's available, does that mean he should play? At this point in the season, with the rotation the way it is, with the way that players feel comfortable with themselves, should Severe Wheeler play in this in this tournament game? 
I'm not suggesting he shouldn't. I'm just asking the question. What does that do to the momentum of the team? I'm so sorry you'll have, you have to hear me snort every other five seconds because uh, the snot is real. I think Toppin is going to have a really, really tough time with, along with Chris Livingston against Bryce Hopkins and Ed, Ed Croswell. I did not realize how efficient of a shooter Croswell was. And on top of this, I didn't realize how efficient of a shooter Bryce Hopkins was. He's shooting 46% from the floor. Again, like I mentioned, 37% from three, 76 from the foul line. He's averaging 16 points, eight and a half rebounds, 2.3 steals, or 2.3 assists, a steal a game. Croswell's averaging over a steal a game. Neither of these two players really get a lot of blocks at all, but they're solid. They're solid. We've seen Jacob Toppin and Chris Livingston, this team, struggle to guard duos of forwards against teams like Kansas, against teams like Florida. That's been a problem. Teams like Vanderbilt, lengthy guards, when there's a duo and you have to slide up in your rotation defensively, Kentucky has had problems. Let's be very clear. This is not an elite defense for the Wildcats. But on the on the flip side, I don't think the Friars defensively have a ton of answers. Now, here's where I'm going against the grain. According to Kim Palm, they actually do, the Friars do, do an eh job, a good job of holding opponents from, uh, from inside the arc. They are 46 nationally in percentage of points that opponents get from two. But to be completely honest with you, I don't really think that matters here. Uh, again, like I've said several times this week, we're throwing out stats this uh, the, the, this uh, for this postseason. We're throwing out most stats. We can look at them to observe things and and discuss different things about how things could go, but there are very little definitives. I think Oscar Shibway having at least an average game is a definitive. But outside of that, there are very few things that you can pick and choose here. This is a good Providence offense heading up against a good Kentucky offense. These are two teams that are top 15, or 16 rather, in the country in offensive efficiency. Points should be scored at a decent rate. I'm not saying we're scoring 85. I'm thinking more 77, 78 at the most. But I think that these two teams are going to score against each other. Kentucky getting to the foul line has been a consistent theme since that Tennessee game. When they get to the foul line, they've done a good job of staying consistent, hitting their free throws. Now, percentage-wise, on the entire season, they're not shooting great. They're shooting about 70%, which is just pitiful. As we all remember, the free throw shooting at the beginning of the year was abysmal, especially from your guards. I think that may be a factor in this one. I think that how you present yourself at the foul line, how often you get to the foul line, is going to be important. Because here's what, uh, here's what the Friars are going to do. They're going to do the same thing that Kentucky wants to do. They're going to try and get to the rim. And they, they will try and draw fouls. They do a really good job at it. They're not going to apply a ton of pressure to you on the defensive end in that department. They're going to make sure that you stay off the foul line for a decent chunk of, uh, of, of the game. But I, I don't know if they're going to be able to hold Kentucky off of it for the entire time. Does Shibwe end up shooting a dozen free throws in this one? Sure. And how he and Jacob Toppin end up shooting in it or shooting in this game could be important from the foul line. It could be the same thing like you like against Vanderbilt in the SEC tournament. If Oscar Shibwe does not go five of eight, Jacob Toppin doesn't go three for six, and Tony Reeves doesn't go three for six from the foul line, uh, Kentucky's got a chance to win that game. They may be up instead of down late. Who knows? So we've talked about the offensive rebounding. Both these teams offensive, uh, rebound the ball well. We've talked about the battle with the forwards. What we've not discussed here is the guard play. Devin Carter, Noah Locke, Jared Bynum, all those three players. What do they do? They get to the rim. Noah Locke is the best three-point shooter out of all of those guys. I'm curious to see who Kentucky pairs up with him. Currently listed at, what, six foot three? Yeah, six foot three, 210. This is a veteran team. That's something else that I'm not pointed out. This Friars team does not have 
a lengthy rotation. They have solid starting production. And then whenever you get to their bench, there is a, there's a significant dip. There's a drop-off. Croswell, Hopkins, Carter, Bynum, Locke. Those are the players that are going to be making the impact in this one. I'll hate it if somebody comes off the bench and drops 20. What the guard play looks like in this one, I don't want to say maybe less important because it may end up being important that Antonio Reeves has to score 25. I don't know. We, we don't know. But I think it's less important than what's going on in the front court. Cason Wallace making sure that he does not let Locke or Bynum uh, go, completely go off in this one, I think is important. Reeves making sure that he sticks with his assignment. I think Livingston's going to have to slide down for the most part here, to be honest with you. By the way, the the, the question also, if we're talking about fr- uh, the Friars having a short bench, probably, does Kentucky do the same thing in this one? Is Frederick going to be fully healthy? Based on what we understand, I think Kentucky's going to be about as healthy as they can get heading into the postseason. So what this rotation looks like is going to be going to be interesting. This is going to be a tough game, straight up. But I think the Wildcats have the ability to get through it. I think they have the ability to outscore uh, the Friars when it comes to just get, getting points in the paint. I think they can keep up on the foul line. Um, I, I hope that Oscar Shibwe has a good game, and I hope that that the Friars do not all of a sudden just absolutely light it up for from deep for no reason. So with all that being said, while I do acknowledge that Kentucky could lose this game by 30, I'm going to pick the Wildcats to win. I am going to go 78-74. That's the final score prediction I have. If you've got a different one, or if you agree, you can leave it in the YouTube comments below. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hey, you can follow the show on Twitter, at Locked on UK. You can follow me on Twitter, at Lance Dahl, underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the comments. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for a live stream discussing this game. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And God bless.